As SpaceX approaches the final days of the second orbital test flight of Starship, all attention is focused on this significant event. However, there's something more surprising at play. Lately, certain details have surfaced, suggesting that SpaceX is in the process of developing a fresh design concept for the Starship human landing system. With unique features unlike any other before, this new design shows SpaceX's meticulous plan for the future like never before. So how does it change? Join us to explore this new design for HLS in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Since 2021, when NASA announced the contract with SpaceX, we haven't seen any updated information about what the Artemis will land on the moon with later this decade. However, recently, there have been new images surfacing, claimed to be new renders of SpaceX's HLS variation of the Starship vehicle, originating from an account on Twitter named David Willis. He's emphasized that these renders are not the work of a random YouTuber or 3D artist. They are official images that were part of the ongoing development process. SpaceX has not directly confirmed this, but it's still an interesting new design. Comparing it with the previous design, which featured a sleek white rocket with integrated solar panels at the top, a design that would be fantastic in a perfect world, but like all spacecraft, is usually not feasible, although aesthetically pleasing. This has been the visualization when discussing Starship's landing on the moon for NASA. So, what are the differences? The new design, as per Willis, is an older one, but he couldn't confirm if it's outdated or not. It presents a much more refined aesthetic. We can see three big changes to the rocket. The first is the solar panels now being deployed from bays at the top of the rocket. While in flight, they can fan out similar to how most spacecraft do solar panels. Once landed on the moon, the panels lower to be flush with the side of the lander. The moon has 1,400 watts per square meter of solar power. Solar energy collection on the moon would be about 25% efficient. The SpaceX Starship is about 50 meters tall. The solar panels are half the height of Starship. The large solar panels are 25 meters tall and 4 meters wide. This is about 35 kilowatts of solar per wing. The total of five such panels is about 175 kilowatts. There is a lighter thin film, flexible solar panel that would enable more power per kilogram transported to the moon. The second noticeable change is to the landing legs. They are much smaller and look fixed in place. The original design showed larger, possibly retractable landing legs. This new design could mean less weight than having the legs needing to retract into the body. Finally, if these renders are real, it shows that SpaceX has repositioned the thrusters to be in several pods around the lander. These landing thrusters are high up to reduce the amount of disturbance they'll cause on the lunar surface. The last thing you need when you're landing is large rocks flying all around you. While we aren't sure if these are real renders from SpaceX, they are of the same style and quality. The render of the Starship HLS landed on the lunar surface even has the same ground features and background as the original. There's a good chance these renders could have been used for some sort of internal briefing with stakeholders like NASA, but never released to the public. In fact, SpaceX and NASA haven't shared a lot about the current status of Starship HLS, but we have seen clues down in Starbase. By clues, I mean we've seen some nose cones with HLS written on them down at Starship's production facility. It could very well signify that their mock-ups of the internal components, perhaps the life support system featuring images of electronic panels and various complex valves. While this doesn't provide an abundance of information, it does indicate a significant development milestone that SpaceX has achieved for their HLS lunar spacecraft variant. During a fireside chat moderated by Watson Morgan in late October, Benji Reed, SpaceX's Senior Director of Human Spaceflight Programs, phrased it as launch's signal and everything else is noise. And really, when we say launch, we're talking about launching safety. We're talking about launching reliably. But you gotta launch and you gotta do it a lot, Reed said. 
And the beautiful thing about the Artemis program and all these different players and everyone working together under Artemis is that all these tests and all these launches and all these vehicles and everything that's happening are all part of that signal launch and test and go. Watson Morgan said her past experience as the deputy director of the engineering directorate at MSFC and more than 30 years as an engineer and manager leads her to fully support and cherish SpaceX's approach to getting its lander ready. However, she added, I'd be remiss if I didn't say we're concerned about the SpaceX schedule for HLS and the concern is that our critical path, even today, goes through these test flights. Watson Morgan and her team are eager to see SpaceX return to flight, stating that they'd like to see around 15 to 17 launches of Starship en route to the crewed landing during the Artemis 3 mission. She said because SpaceX ticks off several objectives with each flight instead of getting everything done before launching once, these test flights are critical for developing the hardware that'll eventually be used to support the HLS program. Schedule for us is key, and we're working very closely with SpaceX on ensuring that this next test, making sure that they're ready for it, understanding what they hope to achieve from it, and understanding the risk. And they are all high risk, Watson Morgan said. Watson Morgan said in addition to the more highly visible flight test campaign, the HLS program and SpaceX have been stepping through some of the development milestones needed to support the version of Starship and the Artemis program. We had a cold start Raptor vacuum test that was recently completed. They're also working on smaller thrusters, Watson Morgan said. In September, NASA announced that SpaceX had successfully conducted tests with a series of engines for the HLS. This crucial test confirmed the engine's ability to initiate and operate under the extreme cold conditions encountered during extended space missions. A notable distinction of Artemis missions from those in low Earth orbit is the potential for the landers to endure extended periods of inactivity in space, subjecting the hardware to temperatures far lower than those experienced in shorter missions closer to Earth. One of the earliest milestones achieved under SpaceX's Artemis III contract, dating back to November 2021, was an engine test that carried immense significance, says NASA. The test served a dual purpose. First, it demonstrated the Raptor engine's capacity to modulate its power output dynamically over time, a critical feature referred to as the throttle profile. Secondly, it substantiated the engine's capability to sustain stable operation for the entire duration of the power descent phase. The favorable outcome of this test filled NASA with early confidence in SpaceX's engine development endeavors. The next milestone in SpaceX's journey toward lunar exploration encompasses the comprehensive testing of the Raptor engines during the company's second integrated test flight of the Starship and Super Heavy launch vehicle, according to Kathy Luters, SpaceX's Starbase general manager. Earlier this year, SpaceX launched its first fully integrated Starship rocket that made it almost to stage separation. Since then, the company's had to wait for regulatory approval for its next launch. SpaceX's Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability, Bill Gerstenmaier, said during a hearing last month that the FAA needs at least twice the resources that they have today for licensing rocket launches. While the FAA has completed as much as it can in the Starship review, it's waiting on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to complete its consultation before it can sign off on another launch. In fact, Fish and Wildlife Service was also back cleaning up the debris talked with Texas Park and Wildlife, and the reason nothing was done for a long time was not to disturb bird nesting. They also made it clear that it could take a long time to pick up every last piece of concrete without stressing the wildlife. Had the regulatory process been completed at this point, the potential of a launch on November 6th, as documentation points towards, would have been on the cards. SpaceX showed during the maiden flight of Starship, they can move into a launch stance within days of approval. With the final element yet to be completed, a target of mid-November becomes a viable aspiration. This Starship flight will mark a crucial journey determining the success of important missions, particularly NASA's planned return to the moon mission set for 2025. Time waits for no one, so we can only hope that Starship will be launched as early as possible. A timeline that will become even more unbelievable when the Starship is stranded on the ground. There are two options to reach distant places in space. Building a truly large rocket with multiple stages or refueling at a halfway point. When SpaceX secured a contract from NASA for the moon mission, 
SpaceX's Starship opted for the latter, considering the more advantageous. Elon Musk has previously said it would take at most only eight Starship flights for refueling to reach the moon. However, NASA has recently declared that Starship would need nearly 20 launches to complete this mission. This is a significantly higher number than the one given by Elon Musk. Why is NASA's assessment so different? If Starship indeed requires 20 flights to reach the moon, what will happen to the Artemis mission? As the tides of innovation surge, SpaceX, with its Starship spacecraft, is about to open a new chapter in the journey of exploring the moon. However, even if the next orbital test flight of Starship proves successful, there are still numerous tasks that SpaceX must address to achieve a lunar landing. One critical aspect is the in-orbit refueling of the spacecraft. A NASA official mentioned that utilizing this vehicle for Artemis lunar landings would necessitate in the high teens of launches, a considerably higher figure than what the company's leadership had previously asserted. In a presentation at a meeting of the NASA Advisory Council's Human Exploration and Operations Committee on November 17th, Lakeisha Hawkins, Assistant Deputy Associate Administrator in NASA's Moon to Mars Program Office, said the company will have to perform Starship launches from both its current pad in Texas and one it is constructing at the Kennedy Space Center in order to send a lander to the moon for Artemis III. SpaceX's operational plan for the Starship Lunar Lander, part of the Human Landing System Program, or HLS, involves a multi-launch approach utilizing the Starship and Super Heavy system. The sequence begins with the launch of a propellant depot into orbit. Subsequent launches include tanker versions of Starship, tasked with transferring methane and liquid oxygen propellants into the depot. Once the depot is adequately fueled, the lander version of Starship takes its turn, rendezvousing with the depot to refill its tanks before embarking on the journey to the moon. The exact number of launches required has been a topic of discussion since NASA selected Starship for the HLS award in 2021. Recent statements from NASA and SpaceX have not provided specific numbers. A paper presented at the 2023 International Astronautical Congress by NASA outlined the deployment of a series of reusable tanker Starship variants to fill the depot before launching the Starship lander, but without specifying a precise quantity. It's in the high teens in the number of launches, Hawkins said. That's driven, she suggested, about concerns about boil-off or loss of cryogenic liquid propellants at the depot. In order to be able to meet the schedule that is required, as well as managing boil-off and so forth of the fuel, there's going to need to be a rapid succession of launches of fuel, she said. That schedule will require launches from both the existing Starship pad at Boca Chica, Texas, as well as the one that NASA is building at the Kennedy Space Launch Complex 39A adjacent to the current pad used for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launches. We should be able to launch from both of those sites, she said, on a six-day rotation. Critics of NASA's selection of Starship for HLS have pointed to the number of launches as a weakness in the architecture. The Government Accountability Office, or GAO, in its rejection of protests by Blue Origin and Dianetics of the Starship HLS Award in 2021, noted that SpaceX required 16 launches overall for a Starship lunar lander mission. Elon Musk, chief executive of SpaceX, disagreed, calling the need for 16 launches extremely unlikely in an August 2021 social media post. He said a max of eight tanker launches should be needed to fuel the Starship lander, adding it could be as few as four. Development of the Starship lander has frequently been seen on the critical path for the Artemis III mission, given that both the Space Launch System and the Orion spacecraft have flown. However, earlier in the committee session, Jim Free, Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development, argued that many more factors are going into that mission. The agency is currently investigating the root cause of the extensive damage to Orion's heat shield in the Artemis I mission, attributed to the unexpected mechanical release of some AVCO intrusion shields. Meanwhile, the SLS consistently faces funding shortages for completion, and there are even opinions dismissing the rocket due to its high costs. Somebody asked me this week, would I want more budget? And I said, sure, of course, more budget would be great, but budget stability is something we could really benefit from, Free said. In addition, Free also expressed interest in the new space travel suits currently being developed by Axiom Space and the addition of a docking port on Orion. 
Yes, the lander is absolutely important. We can't go anywhere without it, but we can't go anywhere without the suits. His comment came a day before the scheduled launch of the second integrated Starship and Super Heavy vehicle, designated OFT-2, which is a key milestone in the development of the Starship vehicle and thus for Artemis. I hope everybody across all of these programs is cheering that on, he said at the launch. We need OF-2 to go. Indeed, at this point, only Starship can be a lifeboat for the U.S. space industry. If the original space race with the Soviet Union was a sprint, this new competition with China is going to be a marathon. The rivalry between the two countries is focused on building a long-term presence on the moon and in cislunar space, the region between the moon and Earth. Whoever gets there first may set the precedent for the next phase of lunar exploration, where nations will exploit resources like water, establish settlements, and pursue scientific exploration. The current tension arises as numerous nations are sending unmanned spacecraft to the moon and forming alliances to explore its mysteries. In August, India achieved the milestone of successfully landing an uncrewed spacecraft near the moon's south pole known for its water ice deposits. This accomplishment came shortly after Russia's unsuccessful attempt. Additionally, both Israel and Japan have recently undertaken unsuccessful missions to land robotic spacecraft on the lunar surface. If China were to be the first to land its astronauts, sometimes known as Taikonauts, it could gain an advantage in establishing the rules of the road for how this new era of exploration will work, said Todd Harrison, a non-resident senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We want to be there for establishing a precedent for mining of materials on the moon and how that's done for making claims to materials and property rights, he said. We want to do that in a way that's consistent with our values and our economic system. And if China gets there first, they'll get to set the precedent that's based on their values and their economic system. China's space program got to a late start. It didn't launch a human into space until 2003, three decades after the United States last sent a human to the moon. But it has built a slow and steady cadence of missions since that has propelled China into the top ranks of space powers, and a continuously inhabited space station in low Earth orbit, and a robotic landing on Mars in 2021. The moon has been of particular interest. After sending a spacecraft to orbit the moon in 2007 and again in 2010, China landed the Chang'e 3 spacecraft in 2013, becoming the first nation to soft land on the lunar surface after the United States and Soviet Union. In early 2019, China became the first country to land a spacecraft on the moon's far side, and in 2020, it brought back samples from the lunar surface, in another impressive demonstration of its growing prowess and ambition. China has now landed spacecraft on the lunar surface successfully three times this century, while the U.S. has not landed there since Apollo 17, the last of the Apollo missions back in 1972. The Chinese know that simply getting there themselves will not somehow make them the winner in the ongoing renewed space competition, said Dean Chang, a senior advisor to the China program at the U.S. Institute of Peace. However, what China does seem to be trying to do is to make clear it will be a major player, if not the major player, in defining the norms and standards for future space activity in the cis-lunar volume of space. To counter that, the U.S. in general, and NASA in particular, need to focus intensively on the Artemis moon campaign to achieve new milestones as quickly as possible. Specifically, agencies should create conditions for SpaceX, especially their new launch vehicle, Starship, to be permitted more frequent launches in the future. That's all for today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Please let us know what you think in the comments below. Your feedback is very important and helps us make better videos for you. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.